truss if you use it on the command line. It's sort of like a wrapper around D-Trace. Um, it doesn't give as fine grain output, but it's useful. Um, all right, so let's S-Trace Ruby. What happens when you S-Trace Ruby? Uh, you get this. Uh, so, you know, what's a SIG VT alarm? They just come up like crazy all over the place. What does that mean? Uh, so it turns out that Ruby uses a uh, system call called set eye timer and signals to schedule green threads. And this only happens in the case where you're not building Ruby with enable pthread, which we'll get into in a little bit. But the first time a new a thread is created in Ruby, Ruby calls set eye timer to create a timer. And it tells the kernel, hey, every 10 milliseconds, send me a SIG VT alarm. I want to know what's going on. And then when Ruby gets that signal, uh, it fires a handler called catch timer. So the second call down there, POSIX signal is attaching uh, that handler to that signal. Um, so let's take a look at the code in the Ruby VM. This is sort of an abbreviated version of uh, what's going on. Uh, you can see here that uh, you have your RB thread start zero function over there on the right. That's called every time a new thread is started. Uh, the first time you start a thread, uh, it'll flip the flag thread in it saying, hey, we started the timer. You're good to go. Uh, POSIX signal right there is attaching the catch timer handler function to the, uh, to the signal. And um, RB thread start timer is calling set timer down there saying, hey, our, our handler set up. Uh, we want to get signals every 10 milliseconds so we can time stuff. Um, so if you S trace Ruby, you can actually see this happen. You attach S trace, you see it call set eye timer. You see the SIG VT alarms come in. Everything's cool. Uh, but the big problem here is that, uh, so the big problem is that when you start uh, one thread, even after all your threads die, the timer still happens every 10 milliseconds, interrupting all of your code, um, which is bad. Uh, and if you estrate your Ruby code, you may say, hey, like, I'm not using threads, so, you know, what's the deal? Uh, well, NetHTTP uh, uses timeout, and uh, NetSNP also uses timeout, and timeout uh, is built on threads. And so once you spawn a single thread, this timeout, uh, the timer that's hitting your reprocess, like I said before, will continue interrupting your Ruby process uh, forever, which is bad. Um, so we wrote a patch to the Ruby VM, uh, stop the thread timer. Uh, it's pretty simple. This check basically says, hey, if I'm the last thread, turn off the thread timer, stop interrupting my Ruby process. I want to be able to run code. You attach edge trace. You can see the timer starts. Some threads were spawned. Uh, alarms came in, and then the timer was turned off. Um, so this is actually a pretty big win. Um, our code started running faster. We didn't have to worry about stuff. Uh, so the next big performance improvement we did on the threading implementation was, hey, we used Debian, uh, Debian servers in production. We edge traced uh, our Ruby process because we were like, oh wow, this Ruby process is really, really slow. What's the deal? Um, so we attached S trace. We saw all these calls to SIG proc mass. We're like, okay, let's get a count of how many of these, how many calls are. It looks like a lot. Um, we run S trace, uh, and there's three and a half million calls to SIG proc mass in about a hundred seconds, um, which is a large number of system calls. Um, so what's the deal with that? Like, why is that happening? Well. It turns out that uh, when you enable pthread, uh, what it's actually, what the Ruby VM is actually doing, uh, sort of a little bit confusing. A lot of people think that when you pass enable pthread to configure, when you build Ruby 1.8, that you're telling Ruby to use native threads. That's not the case. Uh, when you pass enable pthread, it's saying, hey, use a native thread on the system to do the timing uh, for the green thread implementation. Um, and so uh, it's also, enabling pthread is also useful for compatibility with like Ruby TK and uh, other stuff that uses uh, native threading. but if you just look at a diff of what happens when you enable pthread, uh, you get these other defines that pop up, and then those defines create uh, your timer thread uh, if you're using uh, enable pthread, and those other defines go on too, which we'll talk about what that means right now. Um, so it turns out that uh, if you look at the bottom two defines there, it's enabling get context and set context. So what are those functions? What do they mean? What do they do? What's the deal? Um, so get context and set context are part of uh, a system in the kernel called U context. Uh, and it turns out that Ruby can either use set jump and long jump or set context and get context in its threading implementation and for exception handling. Uh, and, and so what they do is set context, uh, U context and the set jump long jump family, they save and restore the current CPU state. So you can save state, execute some code, something bad happens, restore and go back to where you were before. Um, so set jump and long jump do similar things to get context and set context except that uContext is sort of a more advanced version that allows you to modify the internal state. The downside is, though, is that these two functions, save and restore the signal mask, 
uh, and hence call SIG proc mask, which is why we're hitting three and a half million of these calls you know, every time we run Ruby for a short amount of time. Uh, so it's a pretty simple patch to fix this guy. Uh, just patch the configure script, uh, tell it uh, enable new flag called disable u context. So what this does is says, hey, I want the timer thread, but I don't want you to call SIG, SIG proc mask. Um, so with this patch, you can S trace again, all the SIG proc mask calls are gone, and Ruby's now 30% faster, um, which is pretty sick. Cool. So uh, I maintained the event machine gem, and uh, there was this long standing problem that. Yeah. So there was a long standing problem in the event machine gem where if you used event machine with epoll and with threads in the Ruby VM, everything would basically be unusably slow. Um, so I decided I need to take a look at this, um, uh, and this was especially a problem because we were using Thin, and um, somewhere in our code we were using that HTTP, which would enable this timer thread, uh, or uh, it would start the timer signals coming in, and everything would sort of grind to a halt. So I knew I had to profile it, um, so I started out basically building a simple repro, uh, a repro case, basically. So, an event machine, event machine basically handles network I/O, and it allocates big buffers on the stack to copy incoming data, and uh, passes that to Ruby. So I wrote a simple C extension that basically you call the C function, which allocates a large buffer on the stack, and then after allocating that buffer, goes back into Ruby and basically executes a bunch of Ruby code and does a lot of threading. And so uh, I started running this through a profiler, and we decided to use Google Perf Tools, which is um, basically the profiler that Google uses internally. It's really cool. It works really well. So the way you use this is you can you can download it, compile it. Uh, the way you use it is it builds a shared library that you can either link to your application or preload. So on Linux, you can set LD preload, or on OS X, there's an equivalent. And basically, once you set this environment variable, any binaries you launch will first load this library before doing anything else. So once you've loaded this library, uh, all you have to do is set a environment variable called CPU profile and point that at a file name. And once the binary finishes running, it's going to dump out a whole bunch of statistics to that file. Once you've created that file, all you have to do is run this Perl script that they bundle called pprof on that, and it gives you a bunch of output. So the cool thing about this profiler is not only does it have really useful text output, it can create these really nice graphs, uh, and you can just look at this graph and tell right away what's taking the most amount of time. So I ran this on the event machine threading problem, and I got back something like this, and there were some candidates that made sense, definitely thread save context, thread restore context, but it turned out they were all calling memcopy, and this was really surprising, uh, I didn't really believe it at first. So I was like, this can't be true. Like, memcopy really is taking that long. So I decided to try yet another tool and try to confirm that this was actually happening. Uh, so this other tool is called Ltrace. It's very similar to Strace, but it traces library calls instead of system calls. And the syntax is almost exactly the same. So uh, you can run this again with dash C, which sort of gives you a summary. Uh, and sure enough, memcopy is the the first one on there is taking a large amount of time. Uh, again, you can run it in detailed mode and see, uh, get a little bit more information about what's going on in this case. Uh, SIGVT alarm, right after the SIGVT alarm, there were two calls to memcopy happening. Uh, and all of these calls were act adding up. So we know it is definitely calling memcopy, but uh, the question was, what is it copying? And why is it copying so much stuff? Like, what, is, what exactly is going on? So we know it's getting called from thread save context and restore context, so we can pull up the C code for that and sort of walk through it. Um, so the first thing that save context does is call set jump, which we talked about, and we know that that saves the CPU state away. Then after that, it's calling the mem copy. That's where the mem copy is, and it looks like it's accessing the thread stack pointer and stack position and copying something. Uh, so. Uh, it turns out it's actually copying the entire stack associated with that thread, so all the stack frames in that thread are getting copied away. 
And then the third thing it does is save a whole bunch of VM globals uh, that basically tell the VM where it is away into the thread structure. And in restore context, it basically does the same thing in the opposite order. So it restores all those globals, then it mem copies the, the stack back, and then it long jumps to where the CPU had saved state. So we sort of have an idea of what's going on. It's actually copying stacks to the heap, but what, what exactly does that mean? Uh, just gonna explain. Hello. All right. Uh, so before we keep going, is anybody is everybody cool? Does anybody have any questions? Where we're at so far. What's up? All right. All right. Word. Um. So stacks versus heaps. Uh. So all right. So stacks. What's the deal? Uh, storage for local variables. Uh, those variables are only valid while the stack frame is on the stack. And as you call functions, uh, function calls push metadata onto the stack to keep track of where you were called from. Uh, we're going to go through a diagram in a second. Uh, you also have a heap, uh, storage for variables that persist across function calls, uh, and it's typically managed by your malloc implementation, uh, so libc or tcmalloc or whoever you use. Um, so you have this function one right here that you're calling. Uh, function one allocates uh, a void pointer called data. Uh, let's just assume we're on 32-bit. So those four bytes live on the stack. Uh, he calls func2, so that pushes some metadata onto the stack to say, hey, we're calling this function, so when you're done, you have to go back to func1. So func2 is uh, allocating uh, a, a char star string. Uh, the storage for that pointer, the pointer itself is stored on the stack, the four bytes, but the call to malloc right there is gonna put 10 bytes on the heap plus metadata uh, needed by the malloc implementation. And then he's gonna call function3. Uh, function3 is allocating a, a buffer on the stack, thing called buffer, eight bytes go there on the stack. Once func3 returns, um, those eight bytes are gone and it's no longer valid. Um, and so that's sort of the deal, basic gist of stacks versus heaps. Um, so we're mem copying the thread stacks. What does that mean at a high level? So at a high level, you have your, uh, it's kind of cut off, but you have your Ruby process executing. And uh, over here on the left, you have your current program stack. And then these are the other thread stacks in your Ruby process that are saved on the heap waiting uh, for when it's their turn to run. So when a timer comes in or the scheduler decides it's your turn to run, uh, it copies the entire current program stack onto the heap to save the state. And then it copies the next guy to run from the heap onto the current program stack over itself. Um, so, you know, this is interesting. Like we'll figure out what's going on, but you know, first maybe it's interesting to find out what's actually on these thread stacks. Um, so we use GDB uh, to figure out what the deal is. Um, I'm gonna go through like a really quick GDB overview for anybody who's not used it before. Uh, if you're gonna experiment, make sure to build GDB, uh, make sure to build your app with dash GDB and O0, otherwise you'll have to read a lot of assembly. Um, so GDB walkthrough, not too, not too intense. Uh, you run GDB, you pass in your program. Uh, let's start it up, there it is. Okay, you can put a breakpoint on a function. So in this case, this, this program just calculates the average of two numbers. So we set a breakpoint on average. Um, we say, hey, keep running. Uh, GDB hits the breakpoint, freezes the program, and says, yo, I just called average. Here are the two arguments. This is the line of code I'm on in C. Uh, you know, wh what do you want to do? Um, so I said, okay, give me a backtrace. That'll show me, okay, I, I'm in the function average. Average was called from main. This is sort of that idea of a stack that we just talked about a couple slides ago. Um, and you can ask GDB to, so yes, that's the function stack. Uh, so you can ask GDB to give you, to help you walk through the C code line by line. So you can type S and press enter, and then GDB will execute one line of C code and then let you do something else. Um, you can output local variables by just running P and then the variable name. Um, so GDB has lots of stuff. This is just sort of a quick overview of some of the useful features. Uh, you guys should definitely check it out. All right, so what's on the Ruby stack? So we attach GDB to Ruby. We hit backtrace, we wanna see what's going on. And uh, this is just a small snippet of the entire stack trace. Uh, it's pretty massive. Um, as you can see, all C programs, including Ruby, have a main function. Main's all the way down here. Um, main uh, immediately calls Ruby run, which starts the Ruby VM. Um, and then we can see up here like other fragments from our Ruby code. Like I'm sure you guys have used, you know, uh, things in numeric. Like if you say 5,000 dot times and then pass a block, that actually calls the C function in due time, uh, and then 
into due times ends up calling like right above that RB yield uh, to yield to the block that was passed in. So that's sort of how like the inner workings of the VM go down. Um, and if you notice, there's lots of calls in the stack frame, uh, in the stack trace to RB eval. Uh, it turns out that RB eval evaluates code uh, in your Ruby program, and RB eval calls itself recursively uh, throughout the execution time of your program. Um, and that's sort of important. So we want to see like sort of, you know, how big are these stack frames? What's the story? Like, you know, we're seeing mem copy, we're seeing a lot of stuff being copied. Like, let's just get an idea of how big we're talking. Uh, so this is kind of like a little bit of magic right here, but uh, basically what's going on is I'm saying, I'm in GDB and I'm saying, yo, GDB, uh, where I'm at right now, I want to get the base pointer for the current stack frame. And I want to subtract from it the bottom of the stack, ESP. These are just two CPU registers. Uh, so I give this printout and look what comes out, 968 bytes. So each RB eval stack frame is almost one kilobyte, um, which is you know a, a large amount of space to be copying back and forth. Um, and if you want to get the entire distance of the stack, like the entire Ruby program stack right now, uh, Ruby has an internal variable RBGC stack start. You can subtract uh, the current bottom of the stack from that and say, oh look, the Ruby stack is you know 10k. Um, we'll get mem copied back and forth. So you know, if you have uh, 50 method calls, each with one k, uh, uh, each with one k stack frames, you end up with a 50k stack. Uh, it turns out that in Rails, uh, you can have several hundred method calls for a single request. So we're talking about a shitload of data that's getting copied back and forth every time a thread switches. What's up, man? Yeah, 968 bytes for a single stack frame. Uh, so. Uh, Typically, like you only ha you don't have that much space. Like I would say, like anywhere on the orders of uh, you know, 256, uh, 256 bytes is like pushing it on the high end. Um, so the thing is, is that it, it shouldn't actually matter what you have on the stack. It's just that the threading implementation is broken, so it does. Um, so we're gonna get into like how you fix that and like how this stops being a problem, like very shortly. Um, all right. So quick recap on what we got to so far. How do threads in Ruby work? Uh, each thread has its own execution context. You save the CPU registers and you restore them with set jump and long jump. You have a copy of the VM globals and a copy of the stack that's made by calling mem copy. Ruby switch between the thre uh, switches between threads by uh, executing until you get a, a signal from the kernel. It saves the context, calls schedule to pick the next guy, and then restores that that guy's context and he starts going. Uh, and between these two phases, there's two calls to mem copy: one call to save, one call to restore. Uh, but, you know, if you were paying attention at the beginning of the talk, you're saying, hey, yo, like you just said at the beginning that the whole point of green threads is that they're supposed to be fast and cheap uh, at the sacrifice of SMP. You don't get multi-core, but they're supposed to be fast. Um, but, you know, that much copying that we're seeing with all these traces and the code we just looked at is neither fast nor cheap. Um, so how do we fix this problem? Well, we can fix the problem by just not copying stuff. Um, a stack is just a region of memory. Uh, so why don't we just point the CPU at a region of memory that lives on the heap. Um, and then we want to switch to a new thread, we just swap in a new register context onto the CPU, and we just do no copying. Um, so it turns out that's what we can do. We wrote a patch to do that. Um, this is sort of a really, really brief overview of these, the important like few lines that went into the patch. Uh, there's lots of other stuff that has to go on behind the scenes too, but uh, just sort of a quick walkthrough of the zero copy threading patch and how it works. Uh, so when you call RB thread start zero, uh, we allocate uh, a thread stack by calling mmap, um, and then when it's time to switch into that thread to execute, there's just a little tiny trampoline of inline assembly. This inline assembly is just going to swap the stack pointer out manually uh, to switch to the other guy. Um, and so at a high level, how does that actually work? Uh, it's not that crazy, like you have your current executing thread over there on the left, uh, that's your, your current program, and you have these other guys that live out on the heap. When a signal comes in and it's time to switch, you don't copy. You just run that little piece of inline assembly to swap the uh, to swap the stack pointer to the guy who lives on the heap, and you just keep executing. Next time a signal comes in, you do the same thing. You run that little piece of assembly, swap to the next guy that's on the heap. You've now eliminated all the copies that were going on in threading implementation. Um, but you know what does that mean in terms of a benchmark? Uh, so luckily, there's people who like to benchmark things. So we stole a benchmark from a computer language benchmark game. Uh, there's a benchmark called the thread ring benchmark. And to illustrate just sort of the speed boost uh, by this zero thread uh, copy patch, what we decided to do was we're going to grow the stacks a little bit 
and then context switch just to show like how intense this change actually is. Um, so we wrote a little function called grow stack. Grow stack calls itself recursively until it's called itself 20 times. Um, and then it yields to the block that was passed in. Uh, the actual benchmark looks kind of like this. Uh, it's creating 500 threads. Uh, we increase the thread stack size on each thread. Uh, the threads all pause when they first get uh, entered into. And when they resume, they decrement uh, one from the number. And as you can see, number all the way at the top is set to some large value, like 50 million. Um, and so what this is actually doing is this is just basically getting a bunch of threads together. Each thread is subtracting one from the total amount and then dequeuing itself, letting the next guy run. So what we're really benchmarking is the cost of context switching between lots of threads as they all work together to decrement this like shared object. Um, so the results, uh, we passed in 50 million. Uh, on Ruby 186, standard, no patches. Uh, it takes 7,400 seconds, almost 7,800 seconds. That's about two hours and change. Uh, Ruby 186 with our thread fix uh, takes about 13 minutes. Um, so we were pretty happy. Um, what's up? You have a question? Yeah, so that's actually, we're going to talk about GC. We, we're talking again later about GC. Um, so there's like a, an entire separate talk to answer your question, Josh. <laughs> yeah. Sure. 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 So, so the way, so the way it's actually implemented right now uh, in the Linux kernel for processes, there's two models. There's one model where, uh, if you fall off the end of your stack, that causes a page fault. The kernel sees that and then maps more memory in to grow your stack. Uh, but that's sort of the older model of processes in the Linux kernel. The current model of processes in the Linux kernel is to basically set. Uh, a system-wide value with sysconf that's just called our limit stack, and that's commonly set at eight megs. So the system on 32-bit systems is set at eight megs. So uh, the operating system will just say in advance, like, like, hey, you're only going to get eight megs to execute, and then once you fall off that, you're screwed, and the program gets killed. Um, so that's just like a problem in general, right? Like you don't have infinite space. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, I was just going to say. Uh, yeah, we decided just to go with the easiest solution, and we added a thread dot stack size. And so at the beginning of your program, you can set how big you want your stacks to be. Yeah. Uh, and we decided, we, we brainstormed about a couple of solutions to growing stock, st growing the stacks automatically, but decided it wasn't worth it in the end. Cool, so sort of like, you know, we fix this thing, it's fast, it's cool, everybody's happy, like what's next? Well, RV thread schedule sucks. Um, thread switching might be fast, but the scheduler's still pretty bad. Um, this is kind of like a little bit, a cleaned up version of what it looks like. Uh, so it's basically just iterating through the entire thread list over and over and over again, um, you know, five plus times, maybe more. Um, so complexity theory will say that constants don't matter, they just drop out. Uh, but if you have tens of thousands of green threads, uh, you know, going O of N over these things several times can definitely add up. Um, so what's next? What do we do now? How do we fix this? Well, we can rewrite the scheduler, um, but that's too much work. So we can just get rid of the scheduler. Um, and now we've come full circle. We're back around at Fibers. Um, so we're backporting the Fibers API uh, to MRI to use the fast threading patch we just described. Um, so behind the scenes, you just, the way it works, you just create a thread, you don't add it to the schedule list, and then you schedule the thread manually with yield and resume. Um, so hopefully at this point you're asking yourself, like, oh, like, where can I get all this awesome stuff? Um, you get it on GitHub. Uh, I have two branches. Uh, that has the heap stacks thing that we just talked about, the zero copy thing. And Amon has a branch that has uh, some fiber stuff in it. Um, if you don't like applying patches or building stuff on GitHub, you can use Ruby Enterprise Edition. Uh, RE is based on 187. It's free, it's open source. Uh, it has our thread timer fix. Uh, our zero copy threading patch can be enabled with the flag. And it also includes some patches from the MB Airy patch set, which help reduce the stack frame size of important uh, Ruby functions. Uh, so RE is actually really fast, and we're going to talk about it again later in the GC talk. Um, but you can get it there, rubyenterpriseedition.com. Uh, and that's it. So uh, questions, and you can grab us on Twitter, the internet, elsewhere. Yeah, sure, dude. So one more.
1.9, uh, like we said at the beginning, 1.9 uses a different threading implementation, so these patches don't wouldn't apply to 1.9. Uh, and as far as getting this stuff backward to 1.8, uh, the answer right now is no. Uh, and so the reason why this will never be in 1.8 mainline is sort of several reasons, one of which is that uh, our code is platform specific. We only support 32-bit uh, and 64-bit x86 and x86-64 uh, platforms. Uh, and Ruby supports lots of other people, like you know the Human 68K and all kinds of like weird CPUs. Um, and so I don't know. Ruby is you know a lot about portability and stuff, which you know we're just not gonna write instructions yeah. for all the instruction so sets. We've we've uh, submitted some of these patches. Actually, the, the initial timer patch that we talked about that uh, stops the timer once the thread dies was recently accepted and uh, is in the latest 27 P release. Um, and the other patches, like Joe said, are very specific, and that's why we were able to get them in RE because RE is specifically meant for uh, Linux users who are deploying Rails applications on their servers and usually use Intel CPUs. Uh, whereas Ruby itself, as a language, is meant for more general purposes. And inline assembly, like we added, is not going to work across different CPUs. Uh, so it, it depends, like that's like a, it opens up like a huge philosophical argument, right? Because it's like, you know, what do you, what kinds of, you know, what type of threading are you doing? Are you IO bound? Are you CPU bound? And then what do you care about? And just sort of like lots of trade-offs in both directions. Um, so I don't think there's like, you know, one or an answer like, yes, it's better. Like the threading inflation is better here or it's worse there or whatever. I mean, they both have their pros and cons. It's just trade-offs. Yeah. I mean, if you ran the thread ring benchmark on one night, it would be comparable or maybe slightly slower than our patch would and that's just because since you're using kernel threads, the kernel is able to do basically all the magic we're doing in the kernel, and you don't have to do it anymore. Just let the kernel. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. So the slides, uh, I won't, we're gonna have to clean them up a bit because of all the transitions. Um, so hopefully we'll do that tonight or tomorrow, and I'll put it to PDF, and then they'll be on uh, timetobleed.com, uh, my blog, or on Twitter. Um, but yeah, all the stuff will definitely be available once we have. A, you know, a couple minutes to clean it up. Yeah, these slides are actually already up if you go to time to lead and look. Far back, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll tweet something uh, and I'll hashtag it and you guys will be able to find it. logic is that uh, you don't have to write platform specific code because um, different platforms the stacks are different directions and so if you just say hey we're not going to write code free CPU we'll just copy them it makes it a lot easier and you can support things like continuations so our zero copy thread patch actually breaks continuations um, you can fix them but I don't care about continuations so um, what's up uh, you want to take this it's like it's like you execute you save state and you can store that state away and you can resume it later um, yeah, so it's, it's sort of like a thread or a fiber, but yeah. you, you can save state multiple times and jump back to that state multiple times. So in a, in a fiber, for instance, if you save state and resume, it's going to keep going. But with continuation, you can jump back multiple times. Yeah. Uh, it allows for lots of crazy stuff. What's up, man? Yeah, they were never really well supported yeah. in one eight. They leaked, so don't be using that. Uh, yeah. And I think in one nine, you can there are optional libraries that are I don't know in the action board as well. Uh, cool. Well, uh, thanks for listening, guys, and uh, I'll catch you later for GC.